Tim, we're back with season five. Today we are talking trading splits. So what do we need to consider when we're organizing our trading split? We talked about this last week with our frequency, right? A lot of this is dictated to us. So if you're under three days, I'm going to go ahead and tell you it's going to be a two-day total body split, mm -hmm. which it is what it is. You have to have a certain level of exposure to movement patterns or muscle groups in a seven-day calendar week that is going to have some sort of impact on the outcome of an event, a sport, maybe even is body comp oriented. But if you're not doing a total body program with under a three day training split, I just don't know if you're going to get good results. If you're going to do all upper body or do a body part, you're going to miss the boat. But then we get to that exercise of, and I think it's, it's, it's productive to have a conversation around if I had five days, what would I do? If I had maybe four days with two sessions, what would I do? And I think it's going to break up into pretty, two pretty big camps. One being a total body, and that's the lower frequency. I have under three exposures a week towards training. And the other one's a high frequency. And my preference is a upper body, lower body split. And we'll go through why I don't think a push-pull is a good idea. And I do do it, but I don't necessarily think it's a universal thing. And I'll go over why I do do it from time to time. And remember, all models are wrong. Some are useful, that kind of mentality. Same thing with training splits, that there are some that's good and some is bad. And we also got to talk about too, which is really going to be important, is the periodization and how that now intersects, right? So sometimes a total body program is hard to do with a traditional block periodization or sometimes a mixed method conjugate periodization or concurrent focusing on a quality on a given day. But when we're breaking that down, it's going to start with first, how many days a week do we have? And that dictates a lot of the frequency, how we should distribute our movement patterns. And then the final other end of the spectrum is what is our overall focal point from a periodization standpoint? And why did we choose that? So let's say coach gives you two days, but they're back to back, or we can go into other examples of if they're more spread out, how you would organize it. Okay. So again, it's going to be very simple rule. Let's just create rules here. If it's under three days, you have to go total body. So if it's three and under, days, if for whatever reason, the it coach has to be, yeah. it has okay. to be right. Cause when we get into it, like when you think about this upper or lower, we're now going to get something that's not going to get exposure from a movement pattern perspective for seven days. Mm -hmm. If I can get a total body the following day and being strategic with the exercises that I'm doing, not creating some sort of pattern redundancy but also to not crushing aspects of the upper or lower body, we can have a greater residual. And I get what you're saying in terms of that back-to-back -back days. And for the people that don't work in the team sector and don't think this is a realistic problem to deal with, you, you got to get some exposure to the team sector because this is a real thing, right? Hey, you got Monday, Tuesday, and we won't touch them again for 10 more days. And in that case, I think you have to think about the residual. Yeah. What is the residual you're going to have from those two days? And if we look at it from one day, I'm going to do an upper, the other day, I'm going to do a lower. And then now I have to look at that first day I do upper. I'm not going to have any kind of training stimulus for another 10 days. It's going to be too long. The first is if I can get that next day with some sort of upper body stimulus and I can get now nine days, it's a huge win in the grand scheme of things. So yes, in that like hard rule, three and under, it's got to be total body. Now, with that being said, there is a conversation around, around this idea of a hybrid of, I can go up or lower total, which might not fit perfectly into this clean linear distinction of, Hey, this is total body programming versus now this other level of, I'm going to do an upper lower or quadrant base. I'm going to go a upper body. So push, pull upper body on one day, push, pull lower body on another day. And then a third day of a total body. And when you get into that kind of breakdown. There's a rationale to have that because we can saturate and we can focus a little bit more. And a classic example, this might be when we're in season and we want to get as far away from that game week with heavy loaded compound multi-joint movements, specifically of the lower body. But yes, that three and under is going to have at least one day total body, but probably more, more likely to be a total body. And one litmus for this, which is a, as you're stopping and starting, so pause here. Take a second, think about what programming splits you do. And are you hard or steadfast and it's got to be upper, lower or a push pull. And then you go, well, you know, if I'm doing two days, I'm still going to do that. Ask yourself, how do you explain that to the coach and the athletes, even sports medicine, 
right? So you're in that conversation with them. You're talking about, here's our split. And for the record, I think you should have these conversations because I think they're helpful. But if you can't explain or justify to them, you should probably go back and rethink that logic because they need to be in congruence with it because effectively that impacts them just as much as it impacts you, if not more. And when we're trying to break down, all right, I'm going to go a total body versus an upper low or a push pull. Then I'm going to start to get, or a body part split. That's going to be the fourth one. We'll kind of keep teasing out. So uh, we'll, we'll, next question, let's go into uh, how that, how that like a more classic definition of what those actually sessions look like. But if you can't explain it to that coach or that athlete, then you're probably should go back to this drawing board of what your training split should be. So then let's, let's take it back to that next question of like, Hey, you can start getting three, four, five days. You know, how do you organize the upper, lower push pull? and even getting into body parts. Yeah. I don't want to assume everyone knows what this means. So let's go into a total body is going to be a upper body push and pull, a lower body push and pull. And you could do that in a tag of pairing. So I'm going to do a upper, upper and a lower, lower. I can do upper and lower quadrant and tag of pairing. So upper body push, lower body pull and vice versa. And then I break that down into the training. So that's a total body, right? So I'm going to do a combination of an upper, upper and lower body push and pull. And then on the other end, I can go a upper lower. So that's a push, push or push pull of the upper and lower. And then maybe a B series of push pull of the upper and lower siloed off into that individual session and then a push pull. So whatever upper body push I'm doing, I'm going to pair that with a lower body pull. And then I'm going to keep that in the B series. So I'll do again, an upper body push with a lower body pull. And I flip it on the next day where I do a lower body pull with an upper body push, lower body pull with an upper body push. So those are my, my options there. Traditionally used when it's more pattern oriented training. And then you get into a body part split, which gets into more muscles, not movements. Classically used by bodybuilding. But if you're thinking out loud about this, there is gonna be a time where you might wanna visit that with a higher frequency approach. So for instance, an injured athlete, and this has happened time and time again, and I've struggled with that forcing this movement oriented thing into my training program. And it forces me to evolve to, to utilize maybe a body part split. So I have an injured ACL guys coming off of that. He's doing rehab lower there. Are the sports medicine's like, I oh, will handle everything below the waist, right? We got that knee that we're rehabbing, but also on the other end of it, we'll train that other lower body, that other lower extremity. You got everything above the waist. So now I have maybe potentially five days because it's a time game, right? That we got to keep these guys active. We got to keep them motivated. We got to make sure that they're not atrophying and losing money, muscle mass. We got to make sure that the rehab process is dialed in. So one thing that we always talk about with our sports medicine is the limiting factor is them coming in and rehabbing enough, right? So they stop coming because they, you know, they just can't see the trees through the woods and they just lose sight of the value of recurring rehabilitation because it's not going to ever happen quick enough where I've really leaned in hard on, we can develop something, right? If you give me an opportunity, I'm going to develop something that within the scope or the, the best practice with that athlete. So I'm looking at now at that, I'm going to do a five day upper body push or a chest day or a shoulder day. I'm going to do a upper body pull lat day or rear delt. I might break it up into buys and tries on that third day and then repeat. But I'm looking now again at a muscle group as opposed to a movement pattern, because if I'm trying to define to that athlete, Hey, you're going to get a 45 minute session with me. And we're going to go an upper body push, an upper body push, an upper body push, an upper body push. And tomorrow we'll do an upper body pull, an upper body pull, an upper body pull. And we get into this next level of like, why don't you just say it's chest and back? Like, that's probably easier. Yeah. Okay. And that's the final evolution of this when we get to higher frequency. Where it becomes problematic if I'm using pattern oriented stuff for high frequency. So I am a total body day, no matter what. And I got five, six sessions a week. You're going to do a total body training session every single day. Something's going to give, there will be a point of diminishing returns that, that pattern I trained the day before, let's just say it's a lower body bilateral push like a squat, come back the next day. What am I going to focus on more of a unilateral lower body push, come back the next day and then do it again, do it again, do it again, that either I'm not going to be able to apply as much stress as I should. I'm going to get potentially too much fatigue accrued. Maybe I'm just going to start to reinforce bad habits and training hap training focal points, lack of intent. It's more survival. Uh, you see this again and again with more of this uh, 
random ad hoc approach like CrossFit. They just do total body every single day. And we see a definitive drop in performance. If it's not a very deliberate practice it every day, motor learning pattern, I think you should probably visit having some sort of separation with 48, maybe upwards of 72 hours of recovery to allow for that, the muscle or the tissues associated with that movement pattern to recover and regenerate for the nervous system from the systemic load that we apply to that system through those movement patterns to recover and regenerate. And when we're breaking down these higher frequency things, it goes back into those laws and medicines that the outliers of situations determine the rules. And I think about that line quite a bit with everything. I talk a lot about this with our movement our exercise selection, which we'll talk about actually next week, but it's the, it's the fringe of the things that you're working with and what potential small, minute circumstances actually determine your rules more so than what the big average is. Because we become over, overly reliant on, oh, well, this works most of the time. Well, what if you had an extreme circumstance, like, hey, you're going to work them out six days a week and they have no injuries and you could do whatever it is that you want to do and you fall, well, I'm a total body person. You know, don't put your flag in the sand on something as arbitrary as the training split and exposing yourself to different models. This is why it's so productive and beneficial to do bodybuilding for a spell or do powerlifting or do weightlifting. And then you get into that, hey, well, Tim, you just said that, hey, you shouldn't do the same movement patterns back-to-back -back days and you talk about something like weightlifting. Different than powerlifting. Powerlifting is really focused on an upper lower and kind of focused on how do we utilize a conjugate split, a conjugate periodization approach, and the, the split is the product of it. And these are traditional strength athletes. Well, I'd go back into looking at not only weightlifting, but something like strongman. And they are rehearsing a lot of these patterns every day. And that gets into the skill continuum. The lower the skill, the less redundancy you can actually do. The more the skill, the more redundancy you may need. But it has to get into this now high low. We're going to organize the training stress. And then you could either say deliberately, we're going to go up to a certain percentage of a rep max or percentage of speed. Or we just look at it from a governor perspective of like they can't go or they can't override their system. And we're going to do deliberate management of intensity through, hey, we're going to adjust the actual effort they can give during some of these exercises. And all that being considered, the other end of the spectrum of looking at a high frequency really makes you think quite a bit about how you're structuring and organizing your training weeks, how you allocate certain movement patterns on certain days versus others. And I've gotten to this like lengthy discussion on you got to squat on Monday. I've seen plenty of programs, you got to squat on Friday. And that becomes a keystone piece of what you organize everything else. So if I look at that, hey, I got to squat on Monday. Everything kind of works off of that. from the thing you might do from four, maybe it's potentiation or we do weightlifting or plyometric and speed work. The things that you do after from a organizing of load, what can we have success with? Maybe it's the isolation approach, maybe it's an open kinetic approach, or maybe it's a, these things are just going to be structurally balance oriented because we just pounded the lower body anterior chain. Could be a whole host of reasons, but that again, high frequency, what would you do if you had eight sessions spread out over four days or a, a five day approach or whatever it is that you think that you might actually experience and then work through that. And there's no better example of this than what you do for your own programming and how you organize your training. And where do you feel like one, you're not motivated or incentivized to do something on a certain day. And it probably means it was too, it was too fast of a window or too sh short of a window to load that powder again or load that nervous system or that muscular system again, uh, I might meet into uh, maybe not enough of a needs analysis because the reality is, is, is something that's important probably needs to have enough focal point and frequency to actually get something changed. And if it's a, def the, the, a, a deficiency or if it's something that is more linear and that's going to help your performance on the field. Having a strategy around doing that more frequently behooves you. But on the other end, if it's not the same quality in which you want, or you're not motivated to do it for something that's obvious that you need to do, you need to evaluate that and question that as well. So if we were to uh, distill this down into its simplest terms, don't put yourself into a box. Don't put yourself into a box. And then based off of your assessment, determine what's most important, then hammer that into whatever time you're given. Would you say that's pretty accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. So what, 
Well, we're determining what's most important. We kind of hit on it, but how do you organize it? Like, okay, so I, I always squat on Monday, but like maybe Monday is not a good day to squat for that group. How do you go about that process? Yeah, so it goes into the vector in which you're programming. There's, I'm developing weaknesses and then trying to not let them be a, a limiting factor to performance. So we do a evaluation. We find out that you are deficient in lower body strength. And we say that's going to be the focal point, predominantly looking at a lower body push. Let's just say, for example, that's one vector. The other vector is working backwards, right? We know what we need to be going into a certain period of time, like preseason or competition. And we need to have these things in place in order to do that. And we look all the way back to the beginning. What do we need to do on day one? Help us get us quickly and most effectively to that outcome. And whatever vector you're going has a big impact on how you're organizing and structuring your exercises. Because when you do a needs analysis and you find efficiency, that immediately becomes the priority. That that becomes the keystone in which you organize all your training. Again, back to the example of lower body strength, that becomes a big foundational thing in which you're programming the entire week off of. And you're looking at it from maybe a pie chart of, I need to spend 30 to 40% of my week developing this weakness. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you go, okay, I'm going to work backwards from the end. And a lot of times when we do a needs analysis off of what we actually need going into competition, it's just focused about energetic and less about developing leg strength or, or power or anything that's more quality, the, the power relative strength, fun functional hypertrophy, hypertrophy, muscular endurance. And it becomes more bioenergetic of looking at phosphogen system, glycolytic system, and then uh, the oxidative system. And you go, okay, well, what's their preseason look like? What's their practice look like? What's their frequency within preseason? What is the, the, the volume or the total workload they're doing during practice? And how can I create some sort of ramp into that? And how does that shape the exercise selection that you're doing? If you're going to focus on, we need to get three runs going into preseason in order to get these guys somewhat prepared for their preseason camp. Or another example would be like in volleyball, if we need to get a thousand jumps in the course of that last one to two weeks going into preseason, because they're going to do that tenfold in a, a preseason volleyball. And all of that has a big influence on it. And from a weakness standpoint to a strength standpoint, where either I like to analogize it as you're running away from something. And then on a working backwards, or like, I guess a classic term would be SPP to back to GPP, you're running towards something. And this has a big influence on your psychology going into training and training decisions and training split. And one of the things that hopefully was coming across last week, and if you didn't listen to last week's, go back, please go back and listen to that because a lot of the frequency stuff is out of our control. Yep. We rarely have the opportunity to pick how many days a week in the public or the private sector. So having a conversation around, well, what is, you know, ideal versus realistic is probably a fool's gold. It's nice, to, it's nice to thought experiment this and talk in hypotheticals, but the majority of our team sport athletes are going to be working out probably at the upper limit three times a week. And that's coming from a coach that's really into it. And you'll be lucky to get them twice a week for a spring for a sport that's not going to play until the next fall. And when we're breaking down how we're going to do our training split, I think it comes down to, we need enough of exposure in a micro cycle or a window of opportunity that we have in a larger, more integrated plan to develop a lot of things in order to not make a weakness more weak or the other end of it of get us chip away at this iceberg of becoming more physiologically prepared for whatever we're going to do during the course of preseason. And then you go to work and from the outcome back to the start, I think about that quite a bit of if they need to run for 24 periods of practice, accruing six to eight miles, if you're a wide receiver and defensive back or getting a hundred high intensity sprints, if you're an offensive or defensive lineman, in the course of a two hour practice, five days in a row, what do I need to do? And I need to look at that person from a body mass perspective, a body cop perspective, a lean muscle mass perspective. And then I go into this next level of what, what is the, what is the percentile of strength, power, speed that they need to be in? 
And I started to organize my training decision based off of that, not necessarily an arbitrary exercise or a movement pattern that I have an affinity for. Not saying they don't have a preference. I'm just saying we have to be more objective about this. And then from a weakness, it doesn't matter what where we are for preseason camp. This is a very, very big, big thing to work on. It gets into a percentile. Like if they're in the 30th percentile of strength, that has to become a priority. And there's certain movements that are just more congruent with developing strength. Lower body compound, multi-joint movements are going to be there. But in the notion of like just saying, hey, this is your keystone, everything rolls around that comes a lot from what we learned in powerlifting, weightlifting, like snatch and clean and jerk. If you're a weightlifting coach, where am I going to put snatch? Where am I going to put clean? Can I put two in the same day? And then what are the squat, the deadlift, the push and the pull that I'm working with the upper body around that? Mm -hmm. And then you get into this, well, I've come from a more powerlifting, so squat, bench, and dead. And those become the keystone pieces off of what I do. And, and I start to organize my training off of that versus a much more, a much more simplistic way to look at it is what is our problems or where do we need to be? And let's start to develop a plan to attack both of those head on. All right, sweet. Thanks, Tim. I'm out of time. I got a group coming in right now, but this was really good. I appreciate you taking the time. Hell yeah. Thank you, Corey. All right. See ya.